journey together during the year 2024. And uh, so really this morning is when we're going to take the first deep dive into this first section uh, contained here in verses 1 through 7. And uh, I just want to remind you, as I told you last week, the book of Exodus is uh, what is called the second book of the Pentateuch. Pentateuch, remember that? That just means the book of five, and it's referring to the first five books of the Old Testament, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. All five of those books are really telling one singular continuous story. And so we can't just like rip open the Bible and jump into Exodus 1 without knowing some things about Genesis first, or we're going to get really confused and we're going to miss some of the uh, critically important details that start to unfold right from the beginning of the book, like right here in the beginning of chapter 1. It's sort of like you know, those of you who are fellow Star Wars fans, any, any Star Wars junkies out there? All right, got a few of you guys. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you remember, but back in 2015, when the, the heavily, heavily anticipated uh, seventh film in the Star Wars saga called The Force Awakens was finally released. You remember this, 2015? It was, it was the seventh film, seventh part of the story. Uh, and for those of you who are not Star Wars people and you don't, you don't know about this, that the reason that was so unique and, and, and even a bit confusing was because episode one was released in 1999. But episode three was released earlier than that, way back in 1980. And, and part two came out in 2002. And they're just sort of like all over the map with the dates. Like several movies have even come out since 2015 where they go back and they tell all these backstories uh, about how, you know, the Star Wars characters came about. But, but if you walked into the theater in 2015 to see The Force Awakens and you didn't know anything about Luke and Leia and, and Darth Vader and that Jar Jar character, nobody knows how he got in the movies anyway, Right? <laughs> You just showed up, and you got your popcorn, you sat down to watch a great movie. I'm pretty confident that a lot of things just went right over your head, because you had no clue at all about any of those details that had come way before episode seven in order to help you know the rest of the story. Like I, my favorite scene in that movie was when Han Solo and Chewie, they finally step back into the Millennium Falcon, and Han's like, Chewie, we're home. Remember this? And all the Star Wars nerds are like, yes, that is awesome. And the rest of you are like, what's the big deal? I don't get it. What's with the big, like, hairy monkey guy? You know, he doesn't make any sense. If you have no context for what's going on in the story, then I'm sure you miss some of the critically significant moments in that movie. And that is exactly what's going on in verses 1 through 7 of our text today. There are some really significant pieces of information in these first few verses that we are at risk to just gloss over as somewhat meaningless if we do not understand the magnitude of how they relate with what has already taken place in the book of Genesis. And so I'm going to read the text, and, and then what I want to do today is sort of backfill some of those statements with what has already transpired so that we're not left scratching our heads when Han Solo and Chewbacca bow, uh, board the Falcon, okay? I want you to be appropriately amped up over the things that get said here in these first seven verses. And, and not just because Exodus is a cool story, but more importantly, because it's a story about how God relates with his people, which means it's actually our story, right? Right? It's going to help us understand in a deeper way, not only who God is, but also what he's doing in the world and closer to home, what he's doing in each of our lives. So let's read from Exodus 1, starting in verse 1. I'm calling today's sermon, The Genesis of God's Plan for Exodus. You follow along silently as I read out loud in Exodus 1, 1, the word of the Lord says this, these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, all the descendants of Jacob were, what's the number? Shout it out to me. 70, right? That's going to be an important number, and I'm going to come back to that number in a moment. I'm going to ask you to respond in a moment with that number 70. So you just tuck it away for now and be ready when the time comes when I ask for it. Verse 5, all the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died, and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. These are God's words for Keystone Bible Church today. Let's ask the Spirit to come and help us learn them well so that we'll be better equipped to live them out well in the week ahead. If you're a note-taker, and I hope you are, here's the big idea that sits over top of our text. Uh, it's the whole sermon in one sentence, so write this down. I can trust God to keep his promises even when it looks like he won't. I can trust God to keep his promises even when it looks like he won't. Here's what's happening in the, in, in the story so far. Coming out of the book of Genesis, you'll recall that there was a great famine in the land, 
And God raised up his servant Joseph, who was one of the sons of the patriarch Jacob, ultimately to lead as second in command of the entire nation of Egypt. And he did so to save his people from starvation. And and more specifically, to save really one of the brothers named Judah from starvation, because Judah is going to end up being the great, 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 great grandfather of the Messiah, who God had promised to come as a redeemer to save his people from their sins, right? So ultimately, the whole point of all that hardship in Joseph's life was to get him in power in Egypt in order to ensure that Judah wouldn't starve. And that eventually required Joseph to reconcile with his estranged family and to bring them all to Egypt to live with him. And you might remember when they first showed up in Egypt, there weren't a whole lot of them. In fact, here it is. You ready? Verse 5 says, there were how many of them, church? 70, right? Hang on to that number. We'll come back to it. Uh, you're, doing, you're doing fine so far, though. That's how many uh, people were with Joseph. And, uh, but then look at verse 7. They didn't stay that size for very long, did they? No, they grew in number. Look at the spe- specific language that's used here. It says they were fruitful. They increased greatly. They multiplied. They grew exceedingly strong, so much so. Summary statement, the land was filled with them. See that? All right. Now, this is one of those like, oh, my word, it's happening kind of moments. But if you don't know anything about the story of Genesis, you're totally going to miss it. Because the specific language being used here is intended to bring to our recollection some pretty incredible promises that God had already previously made as proof that he is indeed fulfilling those promises. But here's the thing. It's also a moment when you're, you're supposed to, as the readers, just sort of step back and go, wow, like... Like, like, I knew God would keep his promise, but I never saw it playing out like this. Here's the first point I want you to write down this morning. I can trust God to fulfill his promises with his plan. And notice specifically how I'm saying that. He is going to fulfill his promises, amen? But he's going to do it with his plan, not my plan. In other words, God's plan is built on his promises, but the reality is that his plan and the fulfillment of those promises, let's be honest, they rarely play out in the way that you and I think they will. And I want you to, what I want you to know about that is that that's, that's really hard news on the one hand, but I hope you'll see today it's actually also really, really good news at the same time. So let's try to unpack it a bit, and to do so, I think we've got to start by talking about the plan of God Because as fathers of Jesus who are seeking to make mature and multiply disciples in the Tampa Bay area in the year 2024, uh, I I, want to be sure that you understand something. I I want you to know that we are not deists at Keystone Bible Church. Have you heard that word before? Deism, D-E-I-S-M. We are not deists. Deism refers to a kind of spiritual intellectualism that was popular in the 17th and 18th centuries where where people would have like a degree of token acknowledgement in concept for the God of the Bible based primarily on reason and logic, but it was not a faith-produced belief in the heart. And so as a result, it, it never like impacted their daily lives in any real tangible ways. That they would have a, a, an acknowledgement that God is the creator, but there was no sense at all that that God was intervening daily in the affairs of man. So, so they'd look up at the stars, for example, and no problem recognizing that there must be a God out there who made all of that, but no willingness to submit to that God in any like day-to-day, life-on-life kind of ways. They just sort of chalk it all up to, you know, basically like the guy who invented and created an automobile, but is not interested in driving it. He's out there somewhere, like, like he wound it all up, but he's standing aloof from humanity, and now he's just sort of letting creation spin out of control in any way that it will. Here's what I want to say to you about that, church family. If there's a spectrum or, or a continuum of belief that would, would calibrate or calculate our view of God in terms of proximity and comparison to the deist view of God, we are like so far away from that, you wouldn't even be able to draw it to scale. Like it doesn't compute at all. We're on the polar opposite side of that. We believe that God is always in our business, do we not? We believe that God is always intervening in everything that is going on in our world and in our lives, and that he's always actively at work in all of our seasons of joy and and, and happiness, but also in our seasons of sorrow and suffering and even death. We even believe, as the Bible says, that the various kings and rulers and and authorities throughout our world are literally put into place by by God for his sovereign glory and that all of the highs and the lows of our experience under their authority still point to him as an expression of God's sovereign reign for his glory and for our joy. 
See, we just believe that God is in our business all the time. So we could not be further from the belief of the deists. And here's why I bring that up this morning. Because I really want us to have the kind of relationship at Keystone Bible Church where we can be honest with each other. And we can talk really openly about our thoughts and our feelings and our experience as Christians. Don't you want that? Like all in favor of honesty in church? Like if we can't be honest here, like where are we going to be honest, right? So here's the thing. Sometimes I think it's hard for us to reconcile our belief about God's sovereign control over all things with our personal experience in how he operates. Do you struggle with that? In other words, it just doesn't add up sometimes, right? Sometimes we're, we're, we're tempted to look at our, our lives, and if we're honest with ourselves and with one another, like, like we've all gone through really, really difficult seasons where it would actually be easier to reconcile deism, that, that God did like make everything, but that he's not super involved in our lives. That would, that would be easier to swallow than the truth that a loving, sovereign God would choose to fulfill his promises with a plan that involves pain and heartache and suffering. Or in the case of the Israelites, many years of slavery in Egypt. You understand? We've all experienced loss. We've all experienced and endured sorrow. We've all been confused on our journey of faith. And if we're honest, many of us would probably say that we've had moments in all of that where we felt like God had abandoned us. And so we're left trying to reconcile our belief that God really does have a good plan, that he's actively working out in each of our lives with the reality of our current circumstances that often seem like anything but good. And so if that's you today, then one thing I for sure want you to hear me say today is that you're not the only one that feels that way. You're not, friend. We've all been through seasons like that, and many of us would probably even say that we felt that way pretty recently, if not today, if not like right now while we're sitting here. And not only that, but, but I also want to say you're in really good uh, company with the characters of the Bible as well, because some of God's greatest servants have struggled with this exact same thing. The patriarch Abraham and Jacob and Isaac, and we learned about Noah and his struggles in the book of Genesis. King David, Jonah, there was a prophet named Jeremiah who at one point accused God of seducing him. Can you imagine? He's like, God, you've, you've used me. You, you've tricked me. You've deceived me you, to, in order to seduce me. And now you've like walked out and left me. I mean, are you serious? Like, like I'm just saying, we, we all have this common struggle as those who love the Lord to question the good plan of God when it doesn't play out in the way that we expect and hope. But here's what I want to show you in the narrative of this Exodus story. If you'll think back in Genesis when God originally created the entire world and everything in it, all those days of creation, remember that in Genesis 1 and 2, and uh, there was this constant refrain that just kept getting repeated about all of the things that God created. Do you remember what it was? What did God keep saying? His, his, his feeling about all the things that he created. What did he say? He kept saying it. It's good. Over and over. Day one, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. Day two, the atmosphere. Day three, dry land and plants. Day four, sun, moon, and stars. Day five, birds and sea creatures. Day six, land animals and humans. And over and over and over again, it gets repeated. It is good. It is good. It is good. And then after creating the first man and the first woman, the Bible then says this about them. The man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Which isn't primarily a statement about nudity. It's, it's more importantly a statement about the condition of their hearts. In other words, humanity was created to not feel shame. They didn't have any sense of, of needing to hide at all. I mean, can you imagine life like that? They, in that way, they were, they were like newborn babies. Like when an infant comes into the world, little babies, they don't have any sense of uh, shame at all, no awareness that they need to hide anything. Parents, you feel me? You with me? You going to change that diaper? You know, spread them, right? The, the, the baby's not like, oh, this is so embarrassing. Would you please cover me up? I feel really awkward. They don't care at all, do they? There's such an innocence about that little one. that They don't know that, that, that it actually should be embarrassing to take all your clothes off and have somebody clean up your mess. Like, humans shouldn't do this for one another, right? But they're not even slightly nervous about it. They're just like Adam and Eve. They're, they're naked and unashamed, and they don't feel like there's any need to hide that's what the Bible says the first humans were like. But then we read in Genesis 3 that when sin entered the world, all of that changed. And immediately, humanity felt for the first time a sense of shame and guilt coming over them. 
And that would prove then to be the normative human experience for all of us from that time forward. So although we enter the world like infants who don't feel any need to hide and feel shame, that doesn't last very long, does it? I mean, typically already by, you know, like probably age two or three, we start feeling shame because, because when sin entered the cosmos, it fractured everything that God said was good when he made it, including the people, including man and woman, including their relationship with each other. But here's what I want you to recognize about that. In Genesis 3, even as the words of judgment were being pronounced for the sin of Adam and Eve, he was already committed to moving his plan forward in a good way to fix what had been broken. You remember it? Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity, he says to the snake, between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. What's that talking about? That's our first glimmer of grace, isn't it? The first messianic prophecy in all of the Bible. The first shadow of what would one day come in the person of Jesus Christ. The first indication that even though the world is under a curse because of sin, God does have a good plan to fix it. And it's always for our good and his glory. It's going to result in our joy. And that plan is going to involve judgment for sin. But it is also going to involve grace for all of his people. God's like, Adam and Eve, you have messed up big time and things are about to get really ugly. But I promise you this, I'm going to get you out of this mess and I'm the only one who can. I'm going to send an offspring through Eve's lineage who will crush the serpent's head, even as the serpent will inevitably bruise his heel, which is exactly what happened a little over 2,000 years ago when the second person of the triune God, Jesus Christ the Lord, took on flesh and entered humanity as a newborn baby, lived a sinless life that, that we could never live died a substitutionary atoning death in our place, and then later rose from the dead just three days later to offer new resurrection life with him forever for all who will believe and follow him by faith. Satan did bruise him on that cross. But three days later, when Jesus came back out of that grave, he crushed the head of that ancient snake. And one day soon, make no mistake about it, he is going to deliver the final knockout punch once and for all. And all remaining evidence of sin and death and the work of Satan in this world is going down for good. Amen? God's going to unwind it all. He's going to roll it back. And every evidence of brokenness and the effects of sin, it's going away. That's the promise of Genesis 3.15. And it is the first great gospel promise in the Bible that begins to help us understand God's good plan for his people. And then we fast forward to Genesis 12 and we read about another promise. Let me remind you of this, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So the promise here to Abram was that a mighty nation of people was going to be built through his family, right? Right? which would be awesome to hear if you're like 25 or 30 years old. But God gave that promise to a man who was very, very elderly, married to a very elderly wife who had been barren her whole life and never able to have children, right? So if you're going to be the father of a great nation, it just stands to reason that you're going to need some sons. I mean, this is just common sense. It's biological. It's the way it works, right? And because they don't have any sons, this promise didn't make a whole lot of sense to Abram, which is why we read in Genesis 15 after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars. If you're able to number them, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. And I'm sure you remember how Abram went back to tell his wife, Sarah, about this experience, about this promise that God had given him and how she laughed at him. Remember that? She's like, you got to be crazy. I'm like 90 years old. There's no baby coming out of this body, right? But she does have a son, one son, which as great as that was, didn't feel exactly like the fulfillment of a promise of a great mighty nation. And then don't miss this. The great father, Abraham, died. Think about it. Clutching in his hand, nothing 
but a set of promissory notes that God had to that point failed to deliver on. Only one son. The son of promise, yes, but no mighty nation. That's what he had been promised. So, so how are we going to get a mighty nation from one son? And not only that, how are we going to get a mighty nation of people chosen as the uniquely set apart people of God from a family as dysfunctional as this one? Because that's who they were. If you've read Genesis, you know these people were a mess. Like, like I know some of you think you come from dysfunctional families, but you've got nothing on this one. I mean, jealousy and murder and rage and killing each other and sleeping around and drunkenness. and I'm like They're just a train wreck. And yet, they are the ones that God chose to use for the unfolding of his plan and his promise. Can you imagine? See, that's what I mean when I say that the plans of God rarely play out like we think they're going to. And by the time we get to the end of Genesis and we finish that incredible Joseph story, we're still left thinking, like, that was pretty great that Jacob and their sons and their families got saved from starvation. But now here they are in Egypt. And, and did God keep his promise to make them a mighty nation numbered as many as the, the stars of the sky? Tell me again, church, how many of them are there? 70. 70. So, so we're like, wait, what? That's not the ending I was hoping for. Where's the mighty nation? Which is why verse 7 of Exodus chapter 1 ought to leap off the page at us when it says that in Egypt, the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied. They grew exceedingly strong. And the land was filled with them. You hear that? The whole land filled with these people. All right, now we're talking, right? That's starting to sound like a mighty nation. They're in Egypt. They've got this awesome leader, Joseph. And they're starting to get big and powerful in the world. Let's go, right? They're looking really good. Things are looking up. Except, back up to verse 6. Joseph died. And all his brothers and all that generation in fact, glance forward a verse. We'll look at this more extensively next week, but just peek at verse 8. There arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. So Joseph, this short-term savior of the family, died, which is going to be how his family moves from being guests, being cared for in Egypt, to being slaves who are oppressed in Egypt. Which leads me to our second point today. Not only can I trust God to fulfill his promises with his plan, but also jot this down. I can trust him to accomplish that plan with or without me. See, who would have thought that the fulfillment of God's plan would come after Abraham died with no evidence of it ever going to be, you know, possible to be fulfilled? Who would have thought that after all that Joseph had been through, that the story would end with his leadership only resulting in the survival of 70 people? And who would have thought that the setting that God would use to finally begin to expand and to grow these people into a mighty nation would be under the horrific circumstance of slavery? But that's what happened. That, that was the plan of God all along. And 12 chapters later, we get a sense of just how exceedingly large Israel grew while in Egypt. In 1237, I'll put this on the screen, it says, And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot besides the women and the children. So we're not counting women and children there, just the men. 600,000 men. So if all these dudes were married, which most of them probably were, then that's easily well over a million adults, right? And there was no birth control in these days, so most of these families had kids, and probably lots of them. So conservative estimates by historians and theologians are that when, when Israel finally walked out of Egypt in the great exodus, they numbered somewhere between 2.5 and 3.5 million people. So do you see why verse 7 is so important? Because 70 people have turned into millions of people just like God promised. And can you feel a little bit about how it would have been to be an original reader of this text? What, what you would have been feeling if you'd never heard this story before? Like, this is a pivotal moment in a series of five films in the Pentateuch saga where the dots are starting to get connected and the promises of God are finally gaining traction. 
And yet again, no one would have guessed it would play out in slavery. No one would have guessed it would require this massive grouping of God's people to endure oppression and hard labor and to be marginalized and used and abused. But this was the plan of God, and he was moving that plan forward in the fulfillment of his promises, even though nobody would have ever guessed that it would be fulfilled like this. Nobody would have thought that we'd finish Genesis thinking about how this promise uh, could not or would, was not fulfilled through Abraham. It's going to get fulfilled without Abraham, without Jacob, without Joseph. Those guys are out of the picture. God's plan was for all the patriarchs to die with nothing but promissory notes in their hands. And again, I want us to think about how that impacts us and, and just really try to process that in an honest way because in the middle of all that waiting for unfulfilled promises to be delivered, can't life get really, really long and difficult and confusing? When it seems like God is not going to come through. And even though we know the right answers in our, in our day-to-day experience, here's what I know as a pastor, that most, if not all of you sitting in front of me today, have things going on in your lives right now that are causing you to question whether or not you can really trust God to deliver. I know that because you tell me about it. And I'm praying for you about all those things. You're probably not questioning whether he's going to deliver on the last day, like in the ultimate sense, like the once and for all annihilation of Israel when he delivers on his promise to bring forth a new heaven and a new earth. But in this current moment, you're looking around like the children of Israel were when they were in slavery, and you're like, how can this possibly be God's plan? How is this leading me to a good place? And what am I supposed to be doing right now while I'm waiting for deliverance when it seems like it's, like it's never going to come? Where's God in all of this? Do you hear the deist theology in that? Like, I believe God was the creator at the beginning. I believe he's going to be the finisher at the end. But in, the, in, the, in between, like this messy middle, like I'm really struggling to see how any of this is leading to God's good plan for my life. In this diagnosis, in, with this wayward child, in this bad marriage, with this financial hardship, In this painful suffering, how am I supposed to trust God's plan when it doesn't seem like he cares about me? It doesn't seem like he cares about our family. It doesn't seem like he's going to provide for us and and bring about good in our lives. All right, last point. I can trust God to give me a way to obey while I wait. All right, now we know that's the answer in our heads, right? We know waiting is the right answer, but... Just hearing that and writing it down on a Sunday morning in our notebooks is not going to be enough to bolster and cultivate the kind of faith that really does end up finding refuge and confidence in the sovereign plan of God, especially when we have to walk through seasons like what the psalmist describes as the valley of the shadow of death, right? So how can we as a church grow in this? And what does obedience during the season of waiting look like? Well, that's, that's ultimately what I want to talk to you about here in these last few minutes. So jot down these three ways to bolster your faith in God's plan, despite your painful circumstance, okay? Here's the first one. If we're going to trust that God's plan is good and patiently keep obeying him while we wait, then I think, first of all, we have to recognize our limitations. We have to recognize and acknowledge that we are limited as human creatures, Let me see if I can explain that to you. God God has graciously allowed me to uh, be the father of four really amazing kids, ranging in age from 20 all the way down to age eight. And something I've learned about parenting, if you have not learned this already, parents, you will soon, is that bound up in the heart of a child is, is like this ongoing desire to be treated as older than you are at every age in the parenting cycle. Like, like every stage, my kids have dealt with this. The eight-year-old wants to have all the same privileges and opportunities as the 10-year-old, right? And the 10-year-old wants to be just like his 16-year-old brother. And the 16-year-old thinks, uh, thinks he's like already 25. And the 20-year-old for sure thinks he knows more than me at 45, right? Luke, you with me? <laughs> I mean, it's just part of growing up to never want to be satisfied with the age you are, but to always think that you know more than the person above you and constantly want to fast forward through this season into the next season. I mean, I remember it well growing up myself as a teenager, thinking that for sure I knew way more than my parents about virtually everything and that I should not be treated as a little kid anymore. I should be viewed as an adult in this household, right? And so navigating through all that with God's help is just par for the course for Christian parents. And it's why I can remember having virtually the same conversation with with all four of my kids at different times, particularly when they're younger. I just had it with my 10-year-old the other day. He He was upset because of something that his sister was doing and 
You know, like he's going on and on about how he's smarter than her and he should have more privilege and he's older and, you know, he's just all amped up about this situation and, you know, he's right and she's not. And I'm like, okay, calm down. Listen, listen. All right, let's just, let's just go with that for a moment. And let's, let's assume that, that you are indeed smarter than your sister. I want you to tell me, like, like why is that the case? Are you smarter because you know more stuff? Like, did you take a class on this? Did, did you read more books than her? Like, what makes you smarter at 10? I'm just setting him up right? He's like, I'm smarter because I'm older. I'm 10 and she's eight. All right, now I've got him, right? <laughs> so, 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 okay, you're 10 and that fact alone makes you smarter than an eight-year-old. So hypothetically speaking, let's just say, I don't know, maybe I'm like 45 and you're 10. Like, would that not mean that I can see and understand some things going on in your life that, that you don't have the ability to see at age 10? And he doesn't like the way that logic's playing out. So then he's just like, oh, dad, no, 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 right? But this is what I mean when I say we must remember that we're limited. Because if we can agree that a 45-year-old dad just intrinsically has more knowledge than a 10-year-old son about a whole lot of things, simply because I've, I've turned a lot more pages on the calendar than he has in his young life, shouldn't that lead me to a place of greater humility in acknowledging that the God of the ages, who has eternally existed since before the worlds were even created, has been working a sovereign plan for thousands of years, and that he's going to understand and operate and execute some plans in ways that exhibit perfect wisdom from his vantage point, but that are simultaneously very confusing and disorienting from my vantage point. Like, I've been on his earth for 45 years, but God's been working a plan for his earth and the people on it for like 6,000 years, since the beginning of the book of Genesis. Can, so can you see how that is obviously going to mean that our perspectives for what is good might be a little different, right? In the same way that my 10-year-old's perspective for what's good in his life is going to be a little different from my perspective of what's good in his life. God's perspective is not limited in any way. He's, he's always sovereignly leading in ways that are aimed at his glory and my good. But the problem is my little 45-year-old brain cannot see or comprehend the extent to which he's always working toward those good ends. And yet, even though we can't see all of the implications of that, surely at this point in our lives, like, like as I look around the room at, at, most, at the age of most of you, the vast majority of us are old enough to have gone through some fires in life, have we not? We're old enough to have come out the other side of some of those fires and, and now be able to look back on them. And though we'd never want to go through them again, we can see that the fire was a necessary part of how God changed us in that season of time and molded us and, and directed us for the better. Isn't that true? Don't you have some stories like that in your life that you could tell? But in those seasons, do you remember how you felt at the time? Weren't you thinking, seriously, God? Like, like Really? Did you not say, did you not promise? Why are you not coming through? Why can't I trust you to handle this when I need it most? Like, where are you, God? So we become just like the Israelites, don't we? Have you pulled us out of Egypt just to destroy us, God? Looking back, we're like, you idiots. He's rescuing you from slavery, for goodness sakes. He's taking you to the promised land. He is going to make you a mighty nation and a great kingdom under the rule of David and Solomon. He's going to deliver a Messiah through your offspring who's going to save his people eternally from the curse of sin. But in the moment, they couldn't see any, any of that. They just felt the hot sun on their backs and the growling in their empty bellies. That's what I mean when I say we have to acknowledge our limitations. We don't know what God knows. And life isn't just all about us. There's a much bigger plan being unfolded. And that's actually not bad news. That's really, really good news. Because even though we are limited and small, we are not insignificant in the plan of God. Even though we're weak, we are eternally protected by the most powerful being in the universe. Though we are frail and, and so prone to wander in our lives, we matter deeply to the heart of God. And he is acutely aware and actively involved in all parts of his big story to redeem and to restore every example of brokenness that we are feeling and experiencing in our world and in our lives. All of the ups and downs and the joys and sorrows are being navigated and sovereignly ruled over by the God of the universe. That's why I can trust him and obey him even when I don't understand him. The great 19th century preacher, Charles Spurgeon, once said this, God is too big, I'm sorry, too good to be unkind. 
And he is too wise to be mistaken. And when we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. Amen? We can't always see because we're limited, but obedience looks like a choice to trust the heart of God even when we cannot trace the hand of God. So we have to acknowledge our limitations and our inability to see overall what's going on, but that's not the only thing that we need. Secondly, I think we need to learn to read the scriptures honestly. And here's what I mean by that. Suffering and difficulty and loss, frankly, should never surprise us as believers. The Bible is filled with stories like that in the lives of God's people. But unfortunately, what happens in our, in our Christian culture is that we take Bible verses that have far weightier and, and deeper context and meanings, and we like rip them out of the Bible, and we water them down, and we slap them on the side of coffee mugs, and we attach meaning to them that, that they were never intended to mean, so that we can get a nice little feeling that leads us to expect that our lives ought to be happy, healthy, and wealthy all the time, to never go through hard things. But I'm, I'm just trying to be honest with you today in, in saying the Bible doesn't read like that, Okay. It doesn't present an airbrushed, rose-colored version of Christian living. The Bible is grimy and gritty and honest. I mean, Jesus literally said, in this world, you will have trouble. But great news, take heart. I have overcome the world, says Jesus. See, but why would we, why would we read that and think, oh, but I should be the exception. Uh, I shouldn't be experiencing suffering. My life shouldn't be hard. Like, God must not care about me. What? He already told you it's going to be hard. But I thought he promised that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So why didn't I win the big game? And why didn't I get the promotion at work? And, you know, why, why isn't my life working out the way I want it to? That verse isn't working for me. God's not coming through. No, no, friend. That's exactly what I'm talking about. See, when the Bible says that you can do all things, that is not a pregame pep talk to guarantee that you're going to win in every season of your life. You know what that verse actually means in context? That's the Apostle Paul saying that he has learned how to faithfully live for Jesus in times of plenty when he does have a nice house and has some money in his pocket and his relationships are going fine and everything seems stable. But he's also learned that he can faithfully love the Lord and live for him when he's in prison, when he has nothing to eat, when his body is beat up and broken down and bruised. He's like, I have learned that I can faithfully obey my Lord in all of those situations, in all of these things. Christ is the one who empowers my obedience. My circumstances do not affect my love for the Lord at all. But do you see how Philippians 4.13 gets twisted by us to mean something that it was never intended to mean? Like it's, like it's some kind of magic potion that we, we, we sprinkle over any situation where we really want to be successful this time. But the problem is that our success in the moment might actually be contrary to the will and the good plans of God for our lives. You say, how can that be? Well, I'm sure you can think of some situations in your past where if you would have won in the way that that you had wanted to, that would have sent your life off in an entirely different direction from what ultimately ended up being the better plan of God for your life. Can you think of some times like that? Like, I sure can. So we must learn to read the Bible honestly. And Israel would have done well to do that as as well. Because in Genesis 15, in that same chapter where God told Abraham to step outside the tent and to look up at the sky and that his family was was gonna grow to be as many in number as the stars, guess what also we read in verse 13 of that same passage? Look at this. Then the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. See, their time in Egypt had already been foretold. They should not have been surprised by this. But before we blame them, Aren't we the same? Hey, Israel, you're going to suffer in Egypt, but don't be surprised. You know, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to come, but keep trusting God. He's going to bring you out as he promised. How's that any different from, hey, 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 Keystone Christian. Jesus said you're going to suffer in this world. Don't be surprised when it comes, but keep trusting that God is going to bring you back out as he promised. See, we're, we're just like Israel. This, this isn't just their story. This is our story. 
God told Abraham that they would be afflicted as sojourners. So why were they constantly questioning and acting like things were like going out of control? Like, like what's going on here? This can't possibly be God's plan for his people. What? You, you were told it was going to happen, guys. You were even told the timeline. He told you it would be 400 years. And guess how long they were there before God led them out? 430 years, four generations. And can you imagine that? Like 430 years, that's a long time, isn't it? That, that's nearly twice as long as the entire history of our country in the United States of America. So there were entire generations of people who were born and lived their whole lives and then died having never seen deliverance from Egypt. See, so why are we so surprised as believers when more and more difficulty comes while we still wait for deliverance? That has always been part of the kind plan of God to allow for wounds to be afflicted upon his children and allow us to go through seasons that we don't like in order to produce good in and through us for his good purposes, even though we are far too limited to always understand and see how it could possibly be leading to our good. So if we're going to learn to obey him while we wait. We're going to have to learn to read the Bible honestly. We're going to have to learn to recognize our limitations. And lastly, and most importantly, we have to run to the cross. Again, as we think about God's promises not playing out like anyone thought that they would, I mean, the ultimate example of that is Jesus Christ himself, is he not? I mean, here he is on, on earth commanding the storms to calm down, and they do cursing a fig tree and it withers, telling sick people to stand up and not be sick anymore, telling blind people to open their eyes and take a look around for the first time, literally commanding a dead person to come out of the grave and not be dead anymore. I mean, this is for sure the Genesis 3.15 snake crusher who came in human flesh with the power of God to fix the problem of sin. And so here, here we are. We're all on the edge of our seats for what is surely going to be this awesome, epic, head-crushing scene, right? And yet, how does it happen? He's arrested in the middle of the night. He's stripped naked. He's beaten. And he's slaughtered on a cross. And he dies. That's how the head of the serpent got crushed. See, what, what hurdle are you facing that the cross does not have an answer for? I'll tell you, none. <laughs> and that's why we look to the cross. Because the suffering that Jesus endured for us on the cross trumps all of our lesser versions of suffering that we're called to endure while we wait for his return. It clears all of those hurdles. So if you've come in today and you're like, man, man, I am really guilty of some terrible things in my life. In fact, to be honest, I feel pretty uncomfortable even being here because if you people knew who I was and what I've done, you wouldn't want me sitting in these seats with you. No, no, friend, that, that's all of us actually. You have not found your way into a room of, of perfect people. You found your room, uh, your, yourself into a room of broken sinners who are looking to the cross and who understand that there is no sin that is more powerful than the cross of Jesus Christ. So it does not matter who you are or where you come from or what you've done in your life. This is a safe place for sinners because sin, frankly, does not surprise us. Why? Because we're all sinners. We're not okay with sin, but we're certainly not surprised by it. And we're trusting in the fact that there is no sin too great for the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross to cover with his blood payment. That's what I mean when I say that the cross clears all of our hurdles. So, so if on the one hand, you're thinking, oh, I've sinned too much. Like, like I've gone too far. The cross responds with, oh, no, you have not. You haven't even begun to, begun to tap out the, the limitless resources of the cross of Jesus Christ. But at the same time, if you're thinking, I don't need Jesus' sacrifice in my place, the, the cross responds with, oh, yes, you absolutely do. Because nothing else is powerful enough to save you from the depths of your depravity. No matter how small or great you think you've stepped into sin, you need Jesus to cover that for you. But here's the thing for all of us Christians. The cross is not just what we cling to for our ultimate salvation eternally. It's also, friends, what we cling to every single day to fuel our hope and to sustain our obedience when we're faced with every single example of sinful brokenness in our lives and in our world. In other words, it is not just the answer for my sin. It is the answer for all sin and all the effects of sin everywhere. Make note of this. The cross constantly reminds us that it took a crucifixion to bring about a resurrection. 
See, here's the thing. As disciples of Jesus who say that we want to live and look like him, here's the reality. We never look more like him than when we're hanging on our own cross, waiting for his resurrection power to deliver us, right? But make no mistake about it. Listen to me carefully. Resurrection is coming. Reconciliation is coming. Redemption is coming. Exodus is coming. This is God's plan. These are God's promises, and they are no less sure for us than they were for the children of Israel. Even if we feel like we're stuck in the middle of years and years of bondage and suffering, God's plan can be trusted, friends, and his plan is always good. One of the most famous verses in all the Bible, Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Now that sounds awesome, but our problem again is that we want to define good differently than he does, don't we? Even though he tells us exactly what good is in the very next verse. Look at verse 29 of Romans 8. For those whom he foreknew, he also, here it is, predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So good, according to the sovereign plan of God, is anything that conforms you and me into the image of Jesus, which is exactly what Joseph understood when he said in the Romans 8, 28 of the Old Testament to his estranged brothers who had abused and forsaken him, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. See, when God's plan doesn't make sense to us. We have to acknowledge we don't know everything he does. And we have to keep running to the cross to remember that he's willing to go as far as it takes through the valley of the shadow of death in order to come out the other side with his powerful new resurrection life for his glory and for our good forever and ever. Amen? But no matter how hard it gets, do not forget God will fulfill his promises and he will accomplish his plan and he will give you and me a way to obey while we wait. So, dear one, you have not been forgotten, and you are not alone, and it will not always be this way. You and I can trust God, keep his promises, even when it looks like he won't. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the grace of the gospel. This story in Exodus is our story, and we are no less deserving of it than these dysfunctional people that we read about in your word. We need your grace to come into our lives in the same way that, that they did. We need you to take the power of your word today and renew and refresh and change us so that when we walk out of here, though our circumstances may not improve, we will have greater confidence and trust to look to you and, and to your sovereign will as that which is always aimed at our good and your glory. Now, Lord, that doesn't mean we're not going to feel deep emotion in the process. There are, there are those sitting in front of me today who are grieving. They're heavy-hearted. They're confused. They're, they feel lost. They feel, frankly, abandoned. I pray that you would, in the midst of this tumultuous season, come alongside them and use us as a church family as an expression of that. Give them confidence to know that they are not alone that they are not forsaken, that even though they're experiencing trouble as you promised, you have overcome the world. And you're very much using even the details of this specific season to accomplish that good in their lives. May we be a church that understands more about your deep love for us and your commitment to go as far as is necessary to produce new resurrection life in the lives of your people. Help us, Lord. We're weak. We're frail. We can't do this alone. We need you. And we're grateful that you're available. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.